coming this morning. Uh, uh, David told me this is uh, the first breakfast meeting this club has ever had, which I attribute more to the draw, drawing power of Intel than to the fact that none of us are sleeping at nights nowadays. Uh, in recent weeks, the city has been the center of an urgent national debate over the best way to bring our economy back to health. And I thought I'd give you a bit, a bit of perspective this morning from the world of technology and manufacturing, the world that I know best. I think the debate in Washington has been a very healthy one. But at the same time, I worry that we might see what some call an unintended consequence. When we face a crisis, let's all be honest, our habit is to hunker down and hold fast to what we have and what we know. The jobs, the businesses, the institutions, and the ways of life we are all familiar with and don't want to lose. It's a perfectly understandable reaction when uncertainty becomes a part of our lives. But I see this economic crisis differently. Our institutions and paradigms have become unfrozen by this economic crisis. And we have a once in a lifetime opportunity to reshape how things will look and behave as growth resumes. This is riskier. There is more uncertainty. It's less comforting. Taking that leap can be downright scary. But it's the only proven path to pull out of bad times. If you want to see a return of American prosperity, we have no other choice than to invest in creating the future and not merely preserving the past. How we reach for that future and why it's so important is why I'm here today. I don't want to sound cavalier. I know firsthand that we are experiencing the worst economic conditions that we have seen since I began at Intel over 35 years ago. Due to the dramatic contraction of global demand for computers, our revenues dropped 23% in the fourth quarter. And like every company, Intel is taking steps to manage our way through the near-term reality. It's tough on our employees, and it's tough on our business partners. Every business in Silicon Valley is suffering similar results. Indeed, this recession is sparing no part of the global economy. No one is confident predicting what the next quarter is like, yet alone the next year. Our entire country is experiencing anxiety about the future. Today, when I look out at the American economic landscape, I'm aware of a cruel but ironic fact. I've spent my life at a company that has been devoted to a theory, Moore's Law, a theory about the predictability and, and of technology and of product development. And yet I find myself acknowledging that there's nothing predictable about our future economic well-being. On this issue, we need a lot more candor. For nations like the United States, absolutely nothing about the future is inevitable or guaranteed. Not jobs, not leadership, nor our standard of living. We are at an inflection point. The fundamentals to which we have become accustomed have changed. How we deal with these changes can lead us to new heights, or they will define the beginning of a downward spiral. As we contemplate our future, we must accept the fact that many of the assumptions under which businesses operated for the last 50 years simply no longer hold true. The forces of globalization that were reshaping the world before the economy went into a severe downturn are still hard at work today despite the desire of many to, to attempt to turn back the clock. With the emergence of new economic powers like China and India, America no longer dominates the global economic stage. Innovation no longer belongs to a single country or nation or region. It is more evenly distributed and in fact accrues to countries in proportion to the quality and the rigor of their educational systems. The future for every nation will be shaped by new ideas and creativity. These are the engines of future prosperity. I think it's fair to say that today America lacks the confidence that we have the right strategy to maintain unquestioned leadership in this new environment. 
And this leads us to uncertainty about our future. But if you've come today for a depressing message, you've come to the wrong place. At Intel, it's deeply embedded in our culture that times of crisis are opportunities, not only to build back, but to build better. Our former CEO, Andy Grove, once said, bad companies are destroyed by crisis, good companies survive them, great companies are improved by them. I think the same holds true for industries and even for countries. In the current crisis, I believe that America's goal should not be just to survive, but rather to become better than ever. How do we do it? Almost exactly 100 years ago, President Theodore Roosevelt said, the one characteristic more essential than any other is foresight. It should be the growing nation with a future which takes the long look ahead. Looking ahead, it's clear that we are living in one of the most remarkable periods of creativity and possibility. From biomedicine to nanotechnology, the world of life science is destined to change the way we live within our lifetimes. From wind turbines to solar panels, we are at the very beginning of transforming how we generate and consume energy. From broadband to microprocessors, we are connecting the world in ways that were unimaginable a few short years ago. Our challenge is not just, just to enjoy the benefits of the discovery so far. Our obligation is to, in, is to invest to take them further. Taking the long look ahead requires a conscious decision to continue as the global leader, especially while there is a lot more competition for that title. I say conscious decision because remaining the global leader won't just happen on its own. And let me warn you, while it's easy to talk about investing in future technologies, in practice, it can be a frustrating process. For example, we now know an enormous amount about alternative sources of energy, but we still have a long way to go to find a way to power a city efficiently using wind and solar power, yet alone a single car running all day on safe battery power. Nearly all American schools are wired for broadband, but finding a way to use digital content and emerging social networks to craft young minds is not yet a well understood teaching paradigm. We all know that technology has the potential to revolutionize the way that healthcare is delivered, yet we cannot even agree on common standards for electronic medical records. Solving these problems will be challenging and exasperating. But there is good news even before those solutions are discovered. Simply pursuing these challenges will improve us. That is the critical point. We have to invest in the pursuit before the solutions are clear in order to progress. There is an old adage in sports, you can't win if you don't show up. The same is true for these grand challenges of our time. In fact, for any nation in the 21st century, but particularly for the United States, supporting a true culture of investment is the key to long-term success. What do I mean by culture of investment? It begins with common understanding that good investments ought to lead to ideas and discovery, which spawn new businesses that in turn create new jobs and ultimately lead to wealth creation and higher standards of living. The start of this cycle is investment. Investment by government, investment by business, investment by individuals. We will argue about the size, timing, and return of the investments we make. But on this much, there has to be agreement. If we are committed to investing in ideas to improve and not just maintain what we have and what we know, the United States will do more than just recover from this recession. We will emerge once again as a competitive global powerhouse. This is the essential stimulus plan we need, not one which attempts to shore up the status quo or delay the inevitable changes needed. It won't surprise any of you that I believe that the world of technology lies at the heart of creating this future. The invention of the silicon transistor 61 years ago set into motion a chain reaction of unprecedented progress and wealth creation that has kept America at the center of the global economic stage. 
These microscopic building blocks inspired Moore's Law, which has delivered technology that gets significantly more capable and yet costs less year after year after year. At Intel, we see this pace of discovery continuing for the foreseeable future. In fact, some of the most interesting breakthroughs in technology we see today are just the tip of the iceberg. Powerful computing and communications devices that deliver the full internet and fit into your pocket. Computers so inexpensive that the poorest villages in Africa can have them in their classrooms. High-tech sensors that replace the role of full-time nurses caring for the elderly. Smart networks of microprocessors, software, and sensors that will eventually re-engineer our electrical grid. The truth about technology is it is constantly building on, on, on ideas that came before it. This is a critical distinction if we're going to think about investment in the right way. All the breakthroughs I've just mentioned are not one-off products. They're platforms on which thousands of other innovations will be built. That's the model that drives us at Intel. It's the model for the technology industry. And it ought to be the focus of what we do when we talk about stimulating the economy and remaining competitive as a country. Who will deliver these innovations? No one knows. We're working on many of them at Intel. But I've been around long enough to know that the next big breakthrough may come from companies we've never heard of or industries that haven't been invented yet in places we least expect. Remember, the microprocessor was invented in a former prune orchard in a lazy agricultural valley less than four decades ago. By definition, competition is fraught with uncertainty. But one thing we do know is that staying competitive requires a consistent commitment to investing in the future. I'm proud to say at Intel, we've been long willing to back our words with billion dollar investments. I believe the United States has the potential to remain the world's leading innovator, a statement that, to read the press, is increasingly in doubt. And contrary to conventional wisdom, I believe that we can retain a vibrant manufacturing economy here in the United States. But we need to focus on industries of the future, ones in which that we can command a competitive advantage. Intel is a global company today, and proudly so. Yet we still think of ourselves as a prime example of American enterprise in the 21st century. 75% of Intel products today are sold outside the United States. Yet we still build 75% of our products in US factories, and more than half of our employees work here. And 70% of the dollars we devote to research and development and capital investment are spent here in America. We believe in this country, and we believe in its power to create a future that will promote long-term growth. We believe that we can help create that future. Since 2002, we have matched that commitment with our investment, putting more than $50 billion to work right here in America in plant and equipment and research and development. Those investments support over 45,000 Intel high-tech jobs in this country. As tough as these times are, we're not blinking. Today, I'm pleased to announce our intention to stamp the words Made in America on even more Intel products in the months and years to come. Today, we're announcing that Intel will add to its already large manufacturing network with our largest ever investment in a single process technology, and it's in the US. We will invest $7 billion into factories in New Mexico, Arizona, and Oregon to manufacture silicon wafers with the world's most advanced 32 nanometer process technology. These factories, we call them fabs, will produce the most advanced computer technology in the world. These are remarkable sites of innovation. Many Americans think manufacturing means gritty assembly lines and smokestacks. Let me give you a glimpse inside our fabs to show you manufacturing at its finest.
As you can see, these factories are truly remarkable, and we believe that they will produce chips that will transform what is possible. They're platforms for future creativity. Our customers will use them to build world-changing technology. And of course, these factories support jobs, high-wage, high-tech manufacturing jobs that are the economic engines of the states where they're located. The investment will also support thousands of contract jobs for technicians and construction workers. These factories will also incorporate breakthroughs in environmental impact. They will recycle more chemicals, reclaim more wastewater, and have half their power supplied from renewable sources. As a global company, we have made a conscious decision to expand these factories here because we believe that investing in the future of American discovery isn't just the right thing to do, it's an essential business decision if we want the United States to continue to be the engine of new ideas and technical leadership. This is what investment means, putting capital to work, not just for the new products that you will produce, but for creating the capacity for innovation we haven't yet imagined. If investment is going to make a difference, it has to lay the groundwork for the future. As an American manufacturer, I want the idea about investing for the future to be better understood and embraced by other industries and our lawmakers. And that's why Intel is beginning a year-long initiative to bring together some of the world's best minds in business, entrepreneurial circles, academia, the media, and government to lead a discussion on how technology investment can help grow the economy and create jobs. We'll do this in partnership with the Aspen Institute. I'm very happy that Walter Isaacson, uh, the president of the Aspen Institute, is here with us today and will share details about this program soon. Let me conclude with a, bit of a little bit of advocacy. This year we're going to see an unprecedented level of public investment in schools, bridges, roads, health care. It's important. It will make a difference. It's long overdue. But let me be very clear. All that investment is not sufficient. While it may help lift us out of our current crisis, it will not secure our future. By itself, it won't help stimulate the next generation of ideas. A secure future requires investment in areas that will give rise to new industries and new ideas. We can't look to government to do this. In fact, creating the, fu creating the future is an area where American business and entrepreneurialism has a stellar track record, one that I believe we can continue. What I'm asking is that other companies join us, companies that are willing to step up now and place investments to lay the groundwork for our future. Yes, it's important to deal with the realities and inefficiencies of today, but it's essential for the well-being of all of us that we make a collective investment in tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, a couple questions. Uh, first, how many jobs will be created by these, these, the announcement you made today, and when do you think that these facilities will be completed? Um, the investment will, will uh, span 18 to 24 months. The factories are, um, in, in most cases, being uh, retooled as we speak. In some cases, there's incremental physical construction in addition to the, new, to the, uh, to the equipment and lines. Um, but it will all be up and running, peaked in, within 24 months. 24 months. Number of jobs, we'll employ about 7,000 uh, Intel employees in these factories, and the number of contractors and construction workers is, is in the multiple thousands. Okay. Uh, George, you have a question? Can you speak up? There's no mic, so if you can just speak up. George's question was, uh, I said I'm making a conscious business decision to do this here. Um, are there risks associated with that, and could we have done it elsewhere che more cheaply? Um, the answer is um, no and yes. Uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not a risk in the sense of the construction itself or bringing up the technology. We've proven that out. And, and the only element of risk is what's the global demand for these products. Uh, we have a, an un, unfaltering belief in technology, therefore we have a belief that these technologies will be 
will be uh, something that people want to buy. They'll be cheaper, better, faster. So in that, in, that con in that context, we have high confidence. Relative to doing it cheap, more cheaply elsewhere, um, these factories, the fabs, don't, are not driven by labor costs. So doing it in a, in a, in a, in a lower cost la wage area would not s save significantly amount of, a large amount of money. On the other hand, other countries uh, offer significant incentives in terms of uh, taxes or equipment rebates in the, in the hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. It's a $4 billion factory per, for, from a greenfield perspective. The U.S. doesn't do that. Uh, some, some of the states offer small amounts of money, but we thought that on, on balance, having the technology here, being able to use our existing workforce, um, the existing site infrastructure and so forth, allowed us to bring these up much faster and, and, and outweighs any of the offsetting costs. Um, I assume the President is very glad to hear about this kind of investment in our country. Have you had a chance to talk to the President about this? It's, it's funny you should ask. Uh, yes, I have. He, he called me last night at the Hay Adams uh, and uh, after he got back from Indiana and wanted to congratulate us on this announcement. Uh, we talked a bit about it and what it meant. He reminded me that he sees the Intel logo every morning when he opens up his laptop. I was pleased to hear that. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about the, the stimulus package, as you could imagine, and uh, I told him I thought there were some uh, many elements in it, of it that I could get behind. Uh, in particular, health IT, uh, the, uh, the alternative energy investments, uh, rebuilding the classroom infrastructure, broadband investments, um, uh, the uh, funding for the NSF, those kinds of things I think are spectacular. And they meet the criteria I talked about uh, in terms of defining true investments. Um, to finance the uh, buildings of these new facilities, you'll need some debt financing, presumably. Do you have any problems in getting that financing, or you've already worked it out? Um, we don't need to borrow for this. We have uh, 15 billion in cash or so, 12 and a half to 15 billion in cash. Our cash flow, even in this environment, is quite good. So we've typically paid for our factories out of cash. Um, sorry to all the investment bankers that are here. <laughs> um, what country in the world do you actually consider to be the best to do business, and do you think the United States is in danger of losing its leadership position as a great country in which to do business? Oh There's a loaded question. Uh, I think all things considered, this is still the best. I mean, despite the things that we all agonize over, uh, the quality of the education system here, particularly in the graduate schools where we hire um, the majority of our people, is still second to none. Uh, Intel uh, has uh, 40,000 technical degree employees, uh, 4,000 PhDs, 12,000 master's degrees in sciences. So you look at that in terms of what our education system can turn out, and even though they're not all native-born Americans, um, the ability to attract and retain them and, and give them good jobs here still is very, very positive, despite all the, all the other incidentals that go around. In terms of climate for market growth, I'd have to point to the emerging markets of uh, India, China, Brazil, and Russia. The BRIC countries still are the fastest growing uh, markets in the world. The United States is the largest market for computers in the world. China is the second largest. It's now passed Germany and Japan, and China will pass the U.S. within a few years, simply because the law of large numbers. You're on the uh, Google board. How do you compare the cultures of Intel and Google, and how do you believe that they are responsible for the respective successes of those companies? Intel, as you, as you can imagine from the video of our factories, um, is a company of uh, zero defect tolerance. Uh, everything we do has to be precise uh, at levels that are beyond imagination, both in the way we build our products and the way we design our products. You can't have a computer that doesn't work or gives you the wrong answer. And that level of uh, rigor requires uh, many, many years to bring a product out, many hundred, actually close to billions of dollars to bring products out, um, and, then you, and then you win by the scale investment. The Google culture, because of the nature of their product line, is entirely different. It's almost reverse. It's a culture of instant innovation. It's a culture where you don't need three years to build a chip to have a new product. You, you simply get five guys and, and post something on the web as a, as a beta product tomorrow, and if it works, 
you have a new product. So you have a different uh, different kind of thought process involved. Ours to, ours is much much more uh, broadly based. I think theirs is much more the culture of uh, innovation at the individual level. Uh, how will Intel technology be able to help in the alternative energy area, and will you be able to use that technology in manufacturing solar panels? Um, the, the most obvious one is the one I, I mentioned in my speech, which is the, the U.S. electrical grid and probably, perhaps the worldwide grid is really dumb. It's an archaic grid, uh, 18th, early 19th century ar architecture. The ability to harness some of the inefficiency from that grid and uh, use you know, smart sensors and, and smart distribution technologies is really, I think, the number one thing that can happen short term in terms of improving the, the uh, overall consumption of energy. Um, beyond that, uh, thin film work and things like battery technology to improve batteries for things like electric cars uh, is something we're looking at. We're not, not making any announcements there today. In terms of building solar panels, the technology is quite different. The factories are different. Yeah, they're made out of silicon, but it's a different kind of silicon. Uh, it's a linear, much less clean environment. You don't need all the automation we have. It's much less precise. So we're not, we, we spun off a business uh, to do solar panels, but we're not going to make it a mainstream business for ourselves. Um, Andy Grove famously said that only the paranoid survive. Do you agree with that, or do you have a different philosophy of life? <laughs> How could you not? Uh, you know, it, it, yes, I agree with it. Uh, not just because Andy was my, my friend and mentor, uh, but, but it defines our business cycle. Um, someone asked me before about, or Walter was asking me about our products, uh, the product cycles, and I mentioned that uh, in December of every year, 90% of the revenue we get in that December comes from products that weren't shipping in January of that same year. So our whole business model is to cannibalize ourselves in terms of our new products. You, you know, if you don't have a better product, why would you buy a new computer? And so the idea is, is intrinsic to our business model. And, and, and also built into that is the, is the idea that if you don't do it, if there's something that's technologically possible and you don't do it, somebody else will. And the combination of those two drives that healthy degree of paranoia. How do you compare the quality of young engineering students you're recruiting in the United States versus India, China, and other places in the world? Well, as, as I said, the U.S. graduate schools are um, heads and shoulders above, in the, in the physical sciences, are heads and shoulders above anything I've seen. Um, and, and unfortunately, half the seats in those schools are occupied by non-Americans. Non and then when they graduate, we say, thanks very much, you can't have a visa. And then they go away. And it, companies like Intel with a global reach can hire that person in their home country uh, because we have the scope. Other, other companies may not have that. So I think, it's, I think it's, it's, it's a problem for America. I do see the quality of graduate education increasing pretty dramatically, particularly in China, in the physical sciences. Um, in terms of number of engineers being graduated and so forth, and they're getting better and better and better every year. Uh, I, I, I'm not smart enough to know when, when there's a crossover or a catch up, but that day will happen. Okay. Um, what is your view on the uh, current stimulus bill, and do you support that stimulus bill as currently uh, constructed, or do you have any suggestions for improvements? Well, I think I, I made my comment on that, but yeah, I. I uh, in the aggregate, I think um, at the essence of an economic problem uh, or crisis is, is, is confidence. And confidence comes from a number of things. Uh, I think it's, it's incre incredibly interesting to see that the U.S. savings rate, which has been negative for quite some time, is up to 2.8%. Uh, people, as you would expect, uh, who have the means to do so are going to save more right now. That savings increases liquidity. Uh, I think that the government stimulus plan, uh, which includes large amounts of things that I consider investment grade in, uh, spending, is, is very good and will open up the spigots there. And then I'm hoping that, that as that confidence from the savings rate, the liquidity improvements, things that the government's doing, and things like companies like Intel are doing, all lends rise to rebuilding confidence and getting people back uh, betting on the future again. At the end of the day, this is all about confidence. What do you see as the uh, leading technological breakthroughs in the uh, semiconductor industry of the next several years that you can anticipate? This, this technology that we're um, investing in right now, I think, is um, 
the most amazing thing I've seen in my three and a half decades at Intel um, and, and in the industry. Um, for many, many years, Moore's Law re represented uh, faster computers. You got a new microprocessor, the performance doubled every 18 to 24 months. We all saw that going from 286 to 386 to 486 to Pentium. You lived through that. Many of us lived through that. Uh, the level of technology that we're able to develop now at 32 nanometers, I mean, the video had it there. 32 nanometers means you can put 60 million transistors on the head of a pin, on the head of a pin. And so we can build chips with a half a billion transistors on them that are very, very cost effective, that consume very little power, and that are tiny. And they fit into devices that fit into your pockets or that get put into any kind of embedded system around the world. So I think what this technology will do is, is usher in a, a new era of what we call in the industry SOC or system on chip. And today when you buy a computer, there's a lot of chips inside it. Uh, as, as the technology allows you to shrink, you can put all those chips onto one chip. That lowers the cost, it lowers the power, it makes them smaller. But it doesn't make them less powerful. And so I think you'll see in the next three or four years coming out of these, these factories, uh, industry shaping technology that will change the way we all interact with computers around the world. Final question, uh, who do you see as your major competitor, uh, U.S. Uh, semiconductor manufacturers or foreign semiconductor manufacturers or other companies? In the, in the manufacturing um, side, there's really two other companies that are still, in, still investing at global scale, like Intel. Uh, one is Samsung uh, out of Korea, and the other is a company called TSMC, which is a foundry uh, in, in Taiwan. And... Um, Many of the other, the other companies are finding allegiances or, or consortiums to go together. And it's simply the economics. That, uh, if you take one of those factories that I described, they're roughly four and a half billion dollars to build a factory like that. Two or three years to build it. Um, when you have it up and running, you need to generate five to six billion dollars a year of revenue out of it at 50% margin to be able to pay for it. Most of the semiconductor industry is not five billion dollars a year in total revenue in terms of the companies. So you, it leads to a consolidation into places like foundries or, or uh, consortiums. And I think you'll see that shakeout happening in the industry, particularly in these dire economic times. If, uh, Fifteen billion in cash. Have you considered starting your own TARP program? For <laughs> I couldn't find anything that's investable grade <laughs> to put it in. <laughs> To give you our uh, Steuben Glass Award for uh, speaking here. Oh, thank, thank you very you. much. Because I'll drop it. I'll try not to. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.